the book of? Ephesians. <laughs> it's going to be Hezekiah 4.12. Yeah. We're going to be in Hezekiah 4.12. <laughs> so you can go ahead, and start, go ahead and start turning there. I'll give you a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting really near the end. Really near the end. We're walking through the armor. But let me make just a small announcement. When we finish this study, sometime in July, <laughs> yeah. when we finish this study, we'd like to take, it, we'd like to take an opportunity, and I, I don't have the, the list or sheets yet, but you can just write it on a piece of paper. But if you've got a favorite verse that you'd like to have explained or talked about, if you've got a character in Scripture that you'd like to know, you know, something in depth about, a little bit about their history, what they achieved, um, things like that. You know, if you have a person of interest you'd like to know, um, if you have a question um, that you'd like a, a theological opinion on, um, we're going to take a few weeks and do that, and we'll all share together, and I'll print out a sheet ahead of time so that you'll know what Scripture, what person, what topic we're going to be covering that Wednesday night so that you can make sure to be here or you can prepare and have questions or thoughts on it yourself. We can all chime in that way. So that's coming up in a, in, a, in a few weeks. And we'll make a Sunday morning announcement along the same way. And maybe I'll get some sheets cut up so that we can just write down. Uh, Sharon, did you have any other... What, what are the things that we've talked about? With those three things? That was it. Okay, good. So if anybody's interested, um, put it in there. Yeah, we'll put, it, we'll put an announcement. Um, get so people. That would work. I thought about that. Yep. There's a church just outside that door right there to the right. Um, it's for complaints, but it never gets any. So this would be a good opportunity for if you've got a verse or, or anything along that line, that's something that we can discuss as a group. We'll prepare ahead of time. We'll come together and we'll have open discussion. Um, and uh, I may just record the audio of it, not the video of it, so that everybody feels comfortable with discussion. Okay? Does that sound good to everybody? Yeah. All right. So, Ephesians. Let's see where we are. Who's the author? Uh, who's the writer? Uh, well, who is the audience? We are, we, are. we are. Church at Ephesus. Where were they located? Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. <laughs> Uh, over there, right? About what time was it written? 60. Who carried the book? Tychicus. Now, what's the purpose? According to our study. Yeah, a deeper dive. I like that. Explanation of basic principles of the Christian's walk in grace. Just basic principles that, that Paul was presenting to these people. Y'all did good. So we'll skip that, and I, pl I think... We'll go on in. Of course, the first three chapters of doctrine, last three chapters are explanation of that doctrine. He tells us later on in the book that we need to have a renewed mind. And he tells us um, have a renewed spirit of our mind and put on the new life or the new self. And so he's talking about putting on new things, new way of thinking, approaching things by the leadership and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Our, our, our mindset needs to be conformed to the teachings of Christ. And and that's, anybody say that's a challenge? To, to allow Christ to just be the leader of everything in your life and, and to think about things differently now because we are Christians and, and Christ has given us. So that's what Paul was urging them to do. And of course, when you get down in chapter 6, near the end, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So he's... He's laying out his, his final closing argument. And this is something that we face today. This is something that we struggle with today. And if you were to boil it down, if you were just to think about it, and thought about maybe with the Hollywood influence or with the games that, that kids play today influence or maybe even the music that, that people listen to, how would you think that the schemes of the devil would play out? If you, if you, you know, you're familiar with the movies, the... Uh, the possession movies and all those other things, they, they paint a pretty dark picture of, of when Satan is involved. And, and we almost feel like, well, we could spot that. You know, we, if somebody levitated in the room and, and threw up pea soup, we would think, okay, something going on here. This must be the devil. I need to pray. But that's not how he operates, is it? 
He doesn't operate that way. He doesn't present that way. He's done such a good job of, of being undetectable that the, of the vast part of the Western world doesn't even believe he exists. And I don't know if I told the story. I meant to tell it a couple weeks ago, but I had a friend that I went to Bible college with who was from Togo, Africa. And when he was growing up, he was a born-again believer. He was, he was going into the mission fields. He was going to go back to Africa um, and, and be a missionary to his own people. And his people were um, animistic. Uh, they worshipped um, the ancient people that went ahead of them. But they also worshipped different entities. And he told a story that when he was a child, they would begin to, to play drums and get a chant going. <clears throat> and after all that stuff would happen, there would be something that would come up out of the earth. And it was, it was a physical presence that you could see, but it was distorted. and you could, it, it wasn't like a man or it wasn't like an angel or something like that. But there was something that come up out of the earth. And they, as children in this tribe, were encouraged to play with it, to interact with it, to make it part of their life because it was a part of their worship system. And so if that were to happen in America, if that were to happen in a Baptist church on a Wednesday night, um, what would it drive us to, to play with it? Or would it it'd drive us to our knees, wouldn't it? It'd make us cry out to the Lord. So you see, he's done a real good job of convincing the Western world that he doesn't exist. And, and, and the, the different parts of the world, he exists in such a way that they look up to him at, at times. And, and it's part of their history. It's part of their life. It's part of the, you know, the traditions that have been passed down. So they don't have any reason to question. So our enemy, Peter tells us, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so you got to kind of get a feeling of destruction in that, that, that Peter's warning that we need to be sober, we need to be vigilant, we need to be watching and looking because he's wild, he's, he's crafty, he's, he's sneaky. And so this is how Paul's closing down this book, and he's going to talk about the armor of God, which we've already covered a couple of them, but I just want to mention that he says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against rulers and authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, you really can't get any more plain than that, can you? Paul states that they're there. Paul states that they're our enemy. Peter states that it's our enemy. And Paul lays it all on the feet of the devil. He doesn't mince words. He doesn't use words that are hard to figure out. He says, your enemy is the devil. And he has schemes against you. So those schemes that he's using against us, well, it's not just flagrant disobedience necessarily or, or denial that Jesus or God exists. He, 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 you know, he, when he's working against Christians, he's, he's got sneaky little schemes and sneaky little darts that he does and how he works on us or how his minions work on us. I've, I've often said I don't think he knows my name. I'm not a challenge to him, but he's got plenty of, of, of entities that work with him and for him uh, who probably know everything there is to know about me. So Paul goes on and says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. So you see the purpose, withstanding in the evil day. So if we don't even understand what the evil day looks like, if, if we're waiting for some entity to pop up out of the ground and, and for smoke to come in across the lights and for there to be some sort of backward speaking going on in the air or somebody that can, you know, write backward or their eyes roll back in their head, if that's what we're looking for, we're never going to miss what he's doing in our lives right now today. We're, we're, we're never going to see it. We're never going to notice how he's working in the lives of, of Christians, of people in our family, of people that we know and people that we love, because he has schemes. He, he doesn't come out flagrantly, because if he did, it will just drive us to prayer. And that's the last thing he wants. And he doesn't want the Christians reading the Bible or praying, because the Bible tells us that that's the power that, that we have. And so he, said, he goes on and says, so that you can withstand in the evil day. And having done all, stand firm. So we've got to stand against his schemes. And so he tells us about the armor. One of the things we looked at last week, we looked at the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. Then he goes on. So remember that in this, he's kind of drawing a picture of a Roman soldier. And so because the, the, the armor that they wore is very familiar to the people in his day. And so he's, he's using the metaphor of the soldier's armor that they were all familiar with. Because at times a Roman soldier could walk by you and drop all of his gear and say, pick it up. And you had to pick it up, their gear, whoever you were, and carry it for a mile. But you only had to carry it a mile. At that point, you could, you could just drop it, just lay it down. But, but it was required of people to carry their gear. So people were very, very, very familiar with the gear 
Because they saw Roman soldiers on a regular basis. They saw them walking around. There was garrisons posted here or posted there. And that's, you know, Roman, Rome ruled with an iron fist. And so they were always prepared for something to jump off. And so they had, they had, you know, places where they had soldiers placed. And there were places and towns that were retirement, basically, villas for Roman soldiers. And so they were everywhere. Well, tonight he's going to talk about the shoe. Tonight we're going to look at the shoe. So here's a replica. Of a, of a Roman sandal or, or what they would use for battle. Notice something very specific about it is there's something driven through the sole. They had very, very heavy leather, very, very thick. And they had, they had nails like driven through the bottom of them. Of course, they weren't left completely sharp, but it was so that they could keep their footing. Anybody in here play golf? Bless your heart. Anybody in here play baseball with cleats? Football with spikes? Yeah, if you go out on a rainy field and you don't have the right shoes on, what's going to happen? You're going to be on your tail, right? You're going to be on the southern, as I heard a preacher say today, fell on his southern hemisphere. Um, but, they, but so they prepared themselves for battle because if you don't have footing, you can't fight. If you don't have footing, you can't, can't, they can't, couldn't run the army the way the Romans ran the army with that, that shield wall. Um, with, with running in like a spear with a focus point. They, they, had, they, were, they were professional soldiers too, by the way. Uh, they weren't just drafted people that didn't want to be there. These guys did it for a living. They did it for money. And they also knew they could lose their life for um, simple reasons like letting the Messiah get out of the tomb, right? I mean, that's one of the stories that we all hear around Easter. So, so, so this is the, one of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, let me go back a couple slides. Listen to what he says. He said, and as for shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now, he doesn't say here it's for sandals. Um, he, he says, as for a shoe for your feet, having put on the readiness given in the gospel of peace. So it's interesting. The word gospel means good news. Now, a lot of people like to take this passage, and I have in the past, and, and, and think about that passage in the Old Testament. It says, blessed are the feet that, that bear the gospel, right? Because... But that's a blessing by the people that are receiving the gospel. The people that are hearing the good news, they're going to bless the people that went out of their way to bring it to them. So, so what, Paul, what Paul is saying here is, is we have this, this readiness. And so I think one of the main things he's talking about here is having a readiness that's given to us because of the gospel of peace. So gospel means good news. So the good news of peace, well, what is the peace that we have? What did Paul say earlier in the book? that the middle wall of partition has been torn down, that there's no more separation between God and man, and there's no more separation between Jew and Gentile. God has, through Christ, taken all of that down. He has made peace. He made peace with us. And then Jesus tells us in John 14, you know, he, he leaves his peace with us. Peace not like the world has. The world, the world sells peace in a bottle. The world sells comfort in a bottle. Um, a little of this or a little of that or, 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 when, or a lot of other things the world tries to tell us. You know, this is all you need to make you happy. The moment you get it, you're no longer happy. You know, it's like you get a new phone. What comes out the very next week? Another new phone. Anybody ever have buyer's remorse? You simply thought you just got the greatest thing in the world and then you, you get it home and then you start reading reviews and everybody talks about how bad it is and how this doesn't work and that doesn't work and then there's a new one that comes out and the company that sold it to you don't care. They'll sell you a new one. They won't give you your money back on that phone. It's, it's already depreciated over half its value just because you took it home. People do that with cars and automobiles and, and people are chasing after anything for peace. They're chasing after anything for, for comfort. They're chasing after anything for fulfillment, but our fulfillment is only found in Jesus Christ. We are made in his image, and without him, there is no peace. Without him, there's no fulfillment. Without him, there's no wholeness in our life. There's only substitutes that, that don't lead to that kind of fulfillment. It may be for a little while. Uh, there's pleasure in sin for a season. Have you heard that? Pleasure in sin for a season. But it also costs more than you ever wanted to pay. My mom had that written in her Bible when I was little. Sin will, let's see, what is, was it? Sin will, sin will take you further than you ever wanted to go and cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. Um, and, and, and there is, there's, there's pleasure in sin for a season, but it's very seasonal. And then there's the guilt that follows that. There's the conviction that follows that as a child of God. So what Paul's saying to these people is you're going to have to face the wiles of the devil. You're going to have to face his schemes. You're going to have to face warfare. 
And our job is to stand in this warfare. And you think about the Roman wall. They would use their shields, and we'll get to the shield later on, but they would use their shields, and they presented almost, presented almost an impenetrable wall. They could, they could turn it into a block, and they could hold their shields above them, the shields in front of them, shields on the side. You couldn't get to them. And they could just drive through lines and then, and then come around them behind the people they were fighting. And so Paul's using this kind of metaphor, this kind of understanding, to, to let Christians know that if you're not prepared, if you're not prepared for the battle, you can't get prepared for the battle in the battle. And so I've heard several pastors and, I've, and, and, and read after historians that said it would be common if you went to a, to a Roman camp and you, and you would see shields. You may even see their long swords leaning somewhere where the soldiers are taking a break. It's not time for battle. But if you saw the soldier, you'd look at him and he'd still have on the breastplate. He'd still have on the girdle. He'd still have on all the other pieces. And one thing that you never took off was your shoes. You had to have, you can't, you can't jump up and run into battle at a moment's notice and you've got to lace up that wild shoe that they wore, get it on your foot and get it all tight, but you have to be ready. And so God's talking about we as Christians, through the, through the authorship of Paul, um, he's telling us we need to be ready for the warfare because the devil's sneaky. And we're not just dealing with the devil. We're dealing with principalities. We're dealing with powers. We're dealing with cosmic forces and of darkness in the heavenly places. And they're looking for an opportunity for us to not be prepared. And I think a lot of things can happen in our life to where we're not prepared. Have you ever been blindsided by events in your life and kind of reel from it just a little bit? You're just, you're just not ready for all of this to hit. And then what's it seem like happens just as soon as something hits? Something else hits. How many times have you heard people say it comes in threes? Or, or you hear people say, when it rains, it pours. And so, so and this, is, this is along the line of what Paul's teaching to these people at Ephesus, that you're going to have struggles. And it's going to be more than, it's going to be more than co-workers. You're going to have struggles. It, it's going to be more than, than in, inside your own family or, or with, with friends. It's, it's, it's going to be a constant onslaught to knock you off balance. It's going to be a constant pressing a constant pushing and from the cosmic realms fighting against you but we have all that we need in Christ that's why Paul says you got to get up and you got to put on your armor because it's going to happen today and if you don't realize that you were in a spiritual war today you're asleep because you were because they don't sleep. They don't quit. They're always trying to nitpick at your views or nitpick at your beliefs or, or trying to get you to water something down or, or to pull back from it or, or even cast doubt on even the, the, like the goodness of God or the all-knowingness of God. You ever question? You ever question? You know, we have these things that we believe, but you ever stop and go, is that true? I mean, I, th I think it's a normal thing for Christians to go through that. And I think when we're going through that kind of thing and, and we're being knocked around and, and things are hitting us, that the armor becomes more important. And if, and if we're not prepared, if we're not prepared, what's, what's the good news? The good news, Jesus died for us, but there's other good news. Our feet are prepared with the good news of peace. We have peace with God. You realize no enemy can do anything to you that doesn't come through the love of God first. And nothing catches God off guard. And some things he uses as our training, right? Anybody in here struggle with patience? <laughs> Afraid to raise your hand, aren't you, right? Because how many times have you heard a preacher say, well, if you need patience, God's going to send you tribulation. Because that's what the Bible says. Don't pray for patience. Yeah. Don't pray for patience. Because tribulation works patience. The Bible tells us plainly that. But here's the other thing. God intends on you being patient. You say, well, God's got his hands full of me. He can handle you. <laughs> You're not the worst child he's ever had. Amen. He's had worse children. And so being prepared for that onslaught, being prepared for that because of the good news that God's got you. And I heard a story today, and I really doubt that it's true, but I'm going to tell it anyway. But it was a story about a tribe in another country that had one of the members of the tribe had heard about Jesus and, and gave his life to Jesus. And there were some missionaries there, but this was like a headhunters group. They were like cannibalistic and it was a real danger. One of the people in the tribe got saved, received Jesus. And after a little while, they finally, I think, ran the missionaries out. But there was a convert in the camp, in the village. And, and the king or the chief or however it's worded, called in 
the, this guy and, and said, renounce Christ. And he, he said, I can't renounce Christ. Now, the story goes that he began quoting a hymn, and I'm so bad with memory, I can't remember what hymn it was, but it was a perfect hymn for the situation. And so that's, that's why I kind of doubt this is true, but it, but it was a great illustration. He says, I can't deny him. I can't deny him. He's bought me. He's real. I am who I am in him. I can't deny him. And the chief said, well, I'm going to shoot your children. And so as the story goes on, the, the, they called in the archers and his children were shot right in front of him. He says, now your children have been shot. Renounce Jesus. And he said, I can't possibly renounce Jesus because he is more real to me than anything here. And so basically the, the chief threatened him with heaven. Uh, he killed his wife. And he says, now renounce. And the guy says, if there's nobody else with me, uh, still I will follow. That's the hymn. If, if, uh, if I'm all alone, still I will follow. And so the chief took his life as well. And so that day, his children, his wife, and he opened their eyes in glory. As Christians, that's how we should look at that. We should, we should look at that, that he knew when his children were taken from this earth that they were going to be with Christ. And that's walking with faith if the story is true. But nonetheless, there are stories like that that abound. Um, Polycarp um, was in, I believe, Ephesus. And um, they asked him to deny his faith, and he wouldn't do it. And he was an older man. He was in his 80s. And they said, you know, the decree had come out that Christians have to renounce. And, and Polycarp, I said, I can't possibly renounce. He's been too good to me for me to deny him now. And so they went to tie him to the pole and light the fire. He says, you have no need to tie me. I won't run. And the tradition, church tradition goes that Polycarp stood there in that flame and sang hymns until he was overcome with the fire and it killed him. Polycarp got to go home. And we look at that and we think about all the other martyrs that we can read about that stood. They, they had their feet shod with that preparation. They were ready for whatever came their way because of the good news that if I die today, I stand in the presence of Jesus. The good news is that Jesus forgave me of my sins, and I'm now with the Father the moment my eyes close in death. And so you think about how that, that we have to be prepared. We have to be thinking that anything could possibly happen today that could shipwreck your faith, or anything could happen today to catch you off guard. And so I, I think that's why so many Christians throughout the ages have urged us to have a devotional time and have a, a prayer time to, to greet this day, not knowing what evil it's going to hold, but know who holds today. Amen? And so that's, that's what Paul's urging them, to be prepared. Their, 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 their feet prepared with the readiness. Be ready. And then the second part of that in verse 16 says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. In all circumstances, or some of your translations will say, above all, take up the shield of faith. And that doesn't mean take it first or that it's the most important thing. But you see, we're, we're, we're starting to see different tools here. The first set of tools you wear. You get up and put them on, the breastplate, the girdle, the shoes. You, you're wearing them. And now he says, take up the shield of faith. Now that's something that you can lay down. Like I said, that sometimes the soldiers would lay their shields down. Or when, when they were done fighting a certain way and everybody's out on the field, they get rid of that big shield and they may have a smaller shield if they had another shield at all. And they would fight hand-to-hand -hand with the daggers and the broadswords and the short swords. And they, and, and they would fight hand-to-hand -hand without those shields. Paul is urging them to take up the shield. Now, the word for shield here is not the little shield you see sometimes like gladiators would wear. You've seen them, they're in battle, they got that little bitty shield right here, and they got their, their, their broadsword, and, and they're fighting out there. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about the, the shield that they used that was four or five foot tall, and a foot and a half, two foot, three foot wide. It depended on, on, on what part of the army or what kind of soldier you were. But those shields that they would carry, you could hide completely behind. And that's what I mean. They would, they, would hold a, they would get a line of soldiers and they'd hold those shields out front and they'd hold those shields down the side and then they'd hold those shields overhead and you were basically in a place that nothing could reach you. And it was common in that day for people to fire arrows at people that were lit. They're on fire. We, if you've seen a movie about a western or you've seen a movie about this kind of warfare, you've seen people fire or, or watch any Viking movies. They fire arrows that are lit all the time because... You know, those shields primarily were made out of wood and, and they were covered with different things and they'd have some, maybe some thin plate steel on them, but, but they were primarily made out of wood. And, and what, what some of the tradi tradition or teachings that I've heard is that they'd cover this shield with leather. 
or some sort of cloth or things like that. And before they'd go into battle, they would soak those shields so that when the, when the darts hit that were on fire, it wouldn't ruin the shield because the shield is how the army advanced forward behind this wall that was impenetrable. Uh, you couldn't get to these soldiers. And so they would have these shields so, and soaked in water. They were leather covered, soaked in water sometimes or different kind of, of other non-flammable material on them. And so Paul's using something these people are familiar with, something they're aware of. And so listen to what he says. And above all, or, or and on top of all of this, and this says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now think about that. You hear what a precious commodity your faith is? You're, you're the, what a precious commodity that no matter what Satan fires at you, your faith is able to quench that dart. And that's what he does. He gets in our, he gets in our minds. You know, um, Peter, Peter asked, was it Ananias and Sapphira? He says, why has Satan put this in your heart? Ask him directly of that. Because they, they didn't have their shields up. They didn't have their faith up. They didn't have their armor on. And Satan was able to get those people to do the sinful thing of, of lying, not to, not to the church, but to the Holy Spirit. Peter said, it ain't no big deal to you lied to me, but you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And they fell over dead. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful that, you know, that's not something that happens today. Our pews would be empty. Amen? <laughs> but, but that's what Satan does. He gets in our head and he begins to cause doubt. He begins to cause friction. He begins to cause a, a misunderstanding or, or a cloudiness. And, 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 and that's where this armor that Paul's talking about, this is the finally, the conclusion of the book. He said one of the most important things that you've got to do is you've got to put the armor of God on because you're in the middle of a cosmic battle. I'm sure a lot of them said, what battle? I don't see anything. My struggles are with my daughter-in-law. My, 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 my battles are, are with the prince or with the king or with the emperor. The, you know, it's with the army or the tax collectors. That's who my, and he says, no, your battle is not with flesh and blood. It's with the darkness that drives this world system. That's why John was able to write, friendship with this world is enmity with God. And a lot of times it's hard to tell where, where God's world and the, the, the wicked world separate because we, we, we lose our vision sometimes and, and, and we let things kind of creep over and, and we, we, we talk about a gray area. Well, I've never heard God talk about a gray area in Scripture, have y'all? But you live in the world today and there's people that talk about, well, that's a gray area. You know, the Bible doesn't speak necessarily to that. Well, yes, it does. Because the Bible says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the glory of God. And if you're doing anything that doesn't bring God glory, that verse speaks to it. It's black and white. But that makes people upset because we like the gray area. We can swim around in the gray area. We like the, you know, we don't want it completely pitch black, but we don't necessarily want the intense light of the sun. Give me the shade. And that's what Paul is warning about. It's in those shady little areas that Satan, the devil, likes to work on the faith of Christians. He likes to make you question your salvation. You think, well, what harm does it do for somebody to question their salvation? They'll just come back and get saved again. If people are questioning their salvation, they're not good witnesses, are they? They don't have confidence in the God that they claim because, well, he had me, but he lost me, and I'm not sure what I need to do. I mean, you think about the confusion that comes in with that, that God wasn't able to hold on to you. Even though he promised that he would, he wasn't able to. Well, why do I need your God? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not a deep thinker or, or I, I have trouble figuring these things out. And you see, that's how he operates. And that's why the shield of faith, if you think about it, how big is your faith? I mean, you got something you can hide behind like this laptop? That's not hiding very much, is it? I saw a deer. I was out deer hunting one day. And she was lucky she was a doe. And it was early in the season. But I looked up and there was a doe standing behind a tree that wasn't much bigger than that microphone. And she was standing behind it with her body over here, and the tree was here, and she was peeking around it. And I could see every part of her. I could even see where her vitals were. She thought she was hidden behind that tree and that she was safe. She was peeking out at me. I couldn't see her. I could see every part of that deer. And I think a lot of times we think that way too, that, that you know, it doesn't matter how strong my faith is because, well, well, well God's got me. But see, that's what the devil does. He comes in and he begins to take parts away from your confidence in God which begins to weaken 
your faith in those areas. And it, and it gets to be a spot on your shield that Satan can shoot through. And that's what he does. And, and that's why Paul said here, with that, we can extinguish all the flame. All. All means all, and that's all all means. That'll preach all day, won't it? All the fiery darts. Because when we have confidence in God, we have faith that he's going to do what he says he's going to do, that he's got me in anything I face. Imagine how much faith James had to have when he said, hey, count it all joy when life gets hard. And we're like, yeah, I'm not there yet. I've not counted it joy because I'm in the middle of a struggle. But Paul says, listen, think about it. James says, listen, think about it. When you're in the middle of a struggle that God is allowing into your life, it's because he's in the process of shaping you into the image of his dear son, as Paul said. And so God's in that process of shaping us. And so he's got to let stuff into our life so that we can be tested by that. We can be tried by that. And, and, and when God's testing your faith, it's not so he can tell how strong your faith is, is it? Does he know how strong your faith is? Of course he does. If he doesn't, we're wasting our time worshiping him. He knows how strong your faith is. God doesn't test your faith. Let me see how strong Rusty is. Let's see if he can handle this situation in his life. He knows. Rusty needs his faith tested. And I heard a preacher say one time, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. We don't like a testing of our faith. But if your faith can't be tested, it can't be trusted. And how are you going to know that your shield of faith is going to be well to withstand all the fiery darts of the devil if you don't get fiery darts shot at you every once in a while? You find out where your struggles are. You find out where your weakness is. You find out where you're not strong. You find out where you're not committed. You find out where you're not convinced. Those are the areas he creeps into our life. I've seen it time and time again in ministers' lives um, where the creeping into the household came through the children or came through other family members. I've known people that surrendered to the ministry that had godly parents and godly parents said, you don't need to do that. There's, there's no living in that. Won't you think about that again? And everybody on the outside was, they said, I'm going to be a preacher. I'm like, yeah, I can see that. That's all you do. But then inside their own family, a family of faith, they said, well, now, you know, let somebody else go. Let somebody else take care of those things. It's hard being in the ministry. It's a, it's a struggle. And people won't understand because, you know, you'll stick out. And, and that came from inside the family. Well, you know what that is? That's a fiery dart from the wicked one. Because when God says, come follow me, that's all. The only answer is yes. And everybody could be excited. But people are more excited when their kid wants to be an accountant or an engineer. When you tell them I'm going into ministry, they're like, oh, no. My poor father-in-law, he's got two sons in the ministry, two son-in-laws in the ministry. That's rough. I don't know what he did in a previous life, but he got hammered hard, right? I don't believe in a previous life. That was a joke. Our shield of our faith. Our shield of our faith requires study. It requires time. It requires investment. You ever read something in scripture that didn't make sense to you? <laughs> so the best remedy is just close the Bible and say, I didn't get that one. No. no, see, when I read something that I don't understand, I'm like, yeah, I'm not sure that's what that's saying. And then next thing you know, you're six hours later, yeah. 25 books open, and you're still going, boy, I don't get that, and I don't think anybody else did either. I don't know how many times just in preparing this, I've read somebody's commentary and went, nope, I don't think so. No, you're missing this verse. Oh, you didn't understand that verse. Not that I think I'm smarter, but sometimes the puzzles are just put together differently in my mind. But we stay at it and we understand what the Bible says. And when we understand who we are in Christ, our, our, our shield of faith is enlarged. And, and he has trouble getting to us. And that's the process that we're in called sanctification. So the armor of God is important. The, the, the girdle of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, having our feet shod with the readiness, preparedness of the good news, and having the shield of faith by which we can quench a few of the darts of the wicked one. No, all of his 
Isn't that a good promise? All of his darts can be quenched through the shield of faith. Well, I know it's a metaphor, but that's a strong metaphor. Amen? So I think, I think these, pieces, these pieces are worthy of our study, our memorization, and our thought as we get up every morning. I know a lot of people that when they get up, they pray through the armor. They 